Good evening. Welcome to the River Falls Municipal Utility Advisory Board meeting for December 18th. We have a roll call, please, Rhonda. Swanson. Here. Richter. Here. Odin. Here. Mashevsky. Here. Toom. Here. Peterson. Here. Looking for approval of the minutes for the meeting from November 20th, 2017. I move approval of the minutes. Second. All those in favor say aye. 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 All those opposed, same. Minutes are approved. Now's the time for public comments. If anybody in the audience would like to come up and speak, come up to the microphone. Adam, we also have a sign-in sheet up there. And a sign-in sheet. Good evening. I'm Judy Foster Babcock. And I'm speaking to the committee night as a resident and citizen of the of River Falls who has participated over the last four and a half years in the process to evaluate the corridor plan and the ongoing discussion about the future licensing or decommissioning of our dam and hydro facilities. I know that this commission is taking up that question and working through over the next 60 days a recommendation to the council. I encourage you to continue to listen to the community as you have and uh, follow those threads. My own experience in listening to folks on both sides of the keep the dam, remove the dam, drain the pond, don't drain the pond, ongoing conversation and all of the activity that's happened, I really hear very strongly from the community and see in the survey results and the charrette information that the community really wants to free the Kinney, not in the way maybe the, the Friends of the Kinney talks about, but in terms of returning the stream to some better healthy status, whether the dams are there or not in the next five years or 10 years, is something this council, uh, this commission and the council will have to help decide. But I think that the stormwater management issues that you deal with as a board certainly need attention and investment. And so when you consider the costs of keeping the dams, please make sure that those capital costs and those projects are considered when it's presented to the council so that they get a fair and balanced and full cost evaluation rather than just allocated costs and revenues and the net benefit. Because I think you need to take a, a capital view of this particular decision because it is an investment for our community whether we keep the dams or get rid of them. Um, I hope that the river stays healthy through this process and I know that you will do your best to help that happen for our community. Thank you. Thank you. Anyone else? <clears throat> Good evening. Good evening. Um, thank you for the opportunity to allow me to speak this evening. I am here today to deliver upon this committee our petition containing 1,987 signatures requesting license surrender and restoration of the Kinnikinnick River through dam removal. I have provided for a copy for each of you for your reference. Our specific action petition four states, we, the undersigned, are concerned citizens who urge the Kinnikinnick Corridor Planning Committee and the City Council of the City of River Falls to act now to surrender the license for the hydroelectric project. We further request timely decommissioning of the hydroelectric facilities and complete restoration of the Kinnikinnick River through removal of both the Upper Junction Falls Dam and Lower Powell Falls Dam in the Kinnikinnick River as soon as possible. We ask as you review our petition, please take your time to read through the many comments our petitioners chose to share as a part of signing in support of the restoration of the Kinnikinnick River through dam removal. You are going to receive a presentation today from SEH about the Kinnikinnick Corridor planning process and your role in determining how the restoration of the Kinnikinnick River through dam removal or hydroelectric generation fit into our community's future. You will then be asked to consider a resolution at your next meeting on January 15th, 2018, recommending one of three options. We recommend you draft and pass a resolution that day recommending option number two, surrender of the license. Thank you. And what can I do with these? They are for you. Neil Gilbertson, you got. I got one thing to say. Once you give up those licenses, there's a whole bunch of people want those licenses. 
license so they can have their own dam. If we give it up, there's no sense to that. These guys don't have common sense. They don't know the value of a dollar. That's, what I, that's all I got to say. Okay. Thank you. Anybody else have public comment? Uh, moving on, we have the consent agenda, which is acknowledgement of the following minutes, would be the West Central Wisconsin Biosolids Facility Commission minutes, as well as the Powerful Choices Committee meeting minutes. Move approval of the consent agenda. Second. All those in favor say aye. 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 All those opposed, same. Minutes are, the consent agenda is acknowledged. Uh, moving on to new business would be the relicensing of the hydroelectric facilities presentation from Mark. Adam, we have Mark Lobermeyer here from SEH tonight to give our uh, board a presentation on the financial uh, aspects of the hydroelectric facilities and some scenarios regarding relicensing or surrender. Thanks, Mark, for coming tonight. Thanks, Kevin, and, and thank you for having us uh, here tonight to talk about this uh, very important topic going to uh, again also thank Leslie Bartowski from TRC Solutions. She's able to join us at least by phone tonight, uh, so I'm going to do my best to, to remember she's there. Uh, in particular, Leslie's role, um, which really was before uh, SEH got started here, was really to help the city consider what the options were around relicensing. And so if we get into some of the so real fine points of that, um, I'm going to turn to the phone and ask Leslie to, uh, to clarify some of those types of things. So what we want to talk about tonight is really three things. A little bit of an overview around hydropower, talk a little bit about the relicensing process, clarify uh, issues, some questions. There's a lot of conversations, certainly. And then at the end, we'll talk a little bit about some of the actions that uh, ultimately the, the, the utility board is going to need to, to consider uh, regarding the, uh, the two hydro facilities in the community. So start with a little bit of a background in terms of performance of the hydro facilities. So just a snapshot, uh, and, and it varies uh, on an annual basis, but in, in 2016, the two hydro facilities powered uh, something equivalent to what would be 270 homes in the community. You hear a lot about that's one to two percent of the, the total demand in the community, and, and, and those facts are, are certainly true. But when you put it in terms of homes, it's a significant number. You can see that uh, from the graphic, Junction Falls operates a little bit more efficiently. Uh, it's got uh, more water behind it. Uh, the equipment's in, in a little bit better shape, and so it does produce more electricity than Powell Falls. But both the facilities are, are doing a good job the way they were designed and performing for the city. This next graph is, is really, there's a lot of information here, but it's really to illustrate that on an annual basis, and this chart from left to right goes from 1986 through 2016, shows that on an annual basis, there's variation in production. It goes up and down for a number of things. It can be the, the amount of flow, the dams operate in, in a run of the river fashion, so the amount of water going through the dams has an impact on how much electricity they produce. Also the equipment and the maintenance and a, and a number of other things. And you can see in some years uh, lower production and other years the higher production with on the right hand side as that's been trending up for the last several years. And so it really illustrates that it's not a straight line, it's not trending up, it, it does vary over time, but they have been producing consistently for a, a number of years for the city. Is there, is there any way to predict what, what the future, I mean, it's, uh, is it the variation all weather dependent? Is, is that the big factor? Right. It, it's a great question, and it is not all necessarily weather dependent. I, again, I think that that maintenance uh, in particular, and we'll talk about that in a minute, some of the equipment at Powell Falls uh, facility needs some work, needs some rehab. And so when that work is done and the equipment's brought back up to, to initial spec, um, it's going to perform a lot better for you. So there's a number of factors um, that go into it. But uh, I think that the city uh, in, in recent years in particular has done a great job getting the most uh, out of the equipment and the facilities that uh, it owns. So a little bit about each of the facilities. Junction Falls is the upstream facility right at uh, Winter Street. Um, it was reconstructed back in 1990. Um, it has a rate of capacity of 250 uh, kilowatts and it produced about 1.5 million kilowatt hours in 2016. That's an equivalent to around $144,000 in revenue. 
So I want to talk a little bit about revenue, and there's different numbers that are out there. Revenue would be sold uh, electricity. It's not profit, but that's the amount of, of electricity that it produced and, and was sold. That's equivalent, as I mentioned, to about 110 to 185 homes. Why does that vary? Depends on the year. So that's why I showed the, the variation from year to year in the output. One of the questions we've been asked in the past is, what would that look like if it was all done in solar? And the equivalent, if you were doing it in, in solar panels, would be uh, a, a large number, some, something north of uh, 3,000 solar panels to be able to do it. Could you do it that way? Sure, but it would be a, a, a big number. A couple things recently, some inspection reports, and these were in your packet uh, as well. Uh, a recent inspection report on Junction Falls in September said there are no uh, threats to dam safety. They recommended some minor caulking, some brushing, <coughs> maintenance types of things. As I understand in talking with Kevin, a lot of that's already been complete. So routine maintenance, the facility is in very good condition. Um, there are no significant planned expenditures. Um, we did have a conversation today. There is some exterior uh, work on the building that's been recently recommended, and that could run in the range of twenty-five to to fifty thousand uh, dollars, but nothing in, in you know in terms of major capital expenditures. Those types of things fit typically within the the normal budget, and it's something that would be coming forward. Yeah, and the twenty-five to fifty thousand dollars that is repairs on the housing for the generator itself, so that brick structure. Um, tuck pointing and things like that. So that's that's what those numbers are reflecting. We did a recent estimate on that with the help of of some experts, and they gave us a range. But that's what that is for. Lastly, uh, looking out kind of into the future, they're right at this time we don't see any planned large planned capital expenditures because the facility is in good shape. Uh, as I mentioned, it was rehabbed in 1990. Typically, a structure like this, the infrastructure for cities would have a useful life of at least 50 years. And so they can last a long time and, and routinely do. And so the facility, again, is in, in very good condition. Real quick, you've got equivalent solar capacity, th uh, 3,000 solar panels, community solar right now. How many panels is that? I think we're at uh, 750, I think. Uh, in that yeah, range, yeah. yeah. Okay. That was one of the numbers I should have brought along. So good question. Thank you. So a little bit on, on Paul Falls. Paul Falls was built um, earlier, or work done on it much earlier, 1966. Its rated capacity is about half of that. 807 it came to me. 807, perfect. Uh, the rated capacity is about half of Junction Falls, 125 kilowatts. Uh, and in terms of revenue in 2016, about $62,000 in terms of sold uh, electricity. Again, talking about equivalent solar uh, capacity, that's about 1,300 solar panels that would, would be equivalent. Um, and again, that was a question that, that uh, someone said, can you give that information out? So we wanted to cover that tonight. Uh, there's a, an inspection report was done in 2014. It identified no threats to dam safety. And a more recent uh, analysis of Powell Falls looking at not only the structure, but the equipment within the facility uh, identified that there was some need to do some work on the spillway and also some need to do work on the generating equipment. Current estimates right now are in the range of about $250,000. There's also some additional work uh, that needs to be done on the building as well, more on the exterior, uh, tuck pointing of the brick and so on to be able to maintain the facility. And it's similar to what we were uh, told for uh, Junction Falls. So there is some work that uh, is going to need to be done to bring <coughs> that up to a condition that would be similar to Junction Falls. So, <clears throat> so that was that was constructed new in 1966? Yes. And I was going to say, too, on the, re on the repairs of the dam, we did recently get an update on that. We had the, an estimate from a couple of years ago, and they gave us a new estimate, and they added 10% on to it. Yeah. So. And part of the work, that, as I understand, and, I, and I'm not a generator uh, expert, but is to actually take some of the equipment and, and rehabilitate it. The bearings need to be worked on, and, and that'll increase the efficiency of the output. So that's part of that routine maintenance that needs to be done on any equipment um, from time to time. Just to restate it and re-clarify it, really you're talking about three different components, the dam itself, the, the generator itself, and then the building that the generator's in. Those three areas that we're talking about that you, to come up with about $250,000 if you can combine those three areas. In the process of going through a series of, of tech talks through the last year, 
one of the one of the pieces of information that we brought forward at, uh, at one of the meetings was around well, what do the the facilities mean from a financial standpoint to the city this is a, a very simplified version of that discussion but we're going to talk about three pieces sales expenses and then net revenue or profit uh, and we looked at two periods we looked at the the last six years 2010 through 2016 and then we also looked at the period of, of 1986 through 2016. That was the period uh, of record that was available to us. And so you could see that, uh, that the sales are, are, for both of those periods, are, are generally uh, similar but very good revenue in, the last, uh, in that last period, 2010 to 2016, about a million dollars in sales. So that's as you're selling to your customers. Um, expenses, uh, again, are going to vary uh, in a year to year. If we have maintenance, there's going to be some, some work to be done in, in years when there's little maintenance. Expenses are going to be a little lower. Expenses include depreciation uh, and, and other elements, and we can certainly get into what some of those details are. And then the difference is really looking at what's the net revenue, what's the profit um, that that means for the utility and for the city. So in 2010 to 2016, that was about $450,000 in terms of uh, profit directly to the city from operating the hydros. Over a longer period of time, it was about a million dollars in, in 86 to 2016. And that period of time also include the rehab that was done to Junction Falls Dam. And so that's one of the reasons why that number is, isn't higher than, than it is. There was some pretty significant capital expense there and to the tune of about $900,000 <laughs> and that's included. Okay. Typically, no, we don't. Not during this portion, we don't. Uh, free money, isn't it? Well, that that would be the nature of, of profit. So you're again with 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 the asset that the city has, you're able to produce money for the city. Uh, one of the the numbers that's not included in in those figures is something called the uh, it, it's a fee in lieu of taxes that it's actually paid back to the city, uh, and those funds go into the general fund. Uh, last year in 2016, that was about $15,000. And so that shows up in the expense line. We're not reporting it here in net revenue, but that's another, it's another plus that goes back to the city every year from operating the hydro facilities. Um, <clears throat> do you have any idea what the, what the base annual operating cost is mainly for labor, I assume? Um, you know, I don't know what, uh, how much city staff on a day-to-day -day basis is involved, but uh, must be something. Yeah, I don't know if you have those numbers, Mark. I know Julie had worked on those numbers a while back, but I don't think that, I mean, I haven't heard the reporting numbers that were reported. Yeah, she has to, to pull that up. But, so we'll let Julie work, work on that in the background, but we have some reporting numbers that we use for that, Tim. So I gave you a little bit of a snapshot looking backwards at you know what has the performance been and it's tough to to look out to the future but a, a lot of people really had a question what do we think those projections look like so we tried to take what the past operation is going to be and and flip that and look forward another 30 years and what we're showing in this chart is a lot of information uh, or it looks like a lot of information but we're really just showing net revenues our profit by year uh, going out for a 30-year period on the left-hand side, you'll see uh, two bars that kind of drop below the line, and, and really what that's reflecting is as we go through the relicensing uh, or the surrender process, whatever uh, ultimately is, is decided, there's a, a real cost to the city for that. Uh, there's studies and, and a number of things that have to be done uh, for all the filings and compliance with FERC on the, on the regulatory side of things. And so that's why in those years we're actually showing that not only will you uh, use up all of the profit from those years and actually it's going to cost uh, a little bit more than that. Uh, then you get back on more of a, assuming that you continue to operate, you get back on generating profit until you get out in the middle of the graph there and what you see is the revenues pop up for several years. The reason that is is because the depreciation on Junction Falls is now uh, over and so now you're actually seeing a higher uh, net revenue stream for a number of years. You get to the far right of the, the side of the screen there, we're actually anticipating that you're going to need to do some work eventually on Junction Falls. And so we 
assumed a, a, a capital improvement of two to two and a half million dollars may have to be done. Not specific, just trying to use a placeholder to anticipate that you should plan on, on some of those types of expenditures and then you'd see that coming out of the net uh, operating income from the, uh, from the hydros. So Kevin, you want to go back? Yeah, we, so we do have that down here. So the, to Tim's question, so we had budgeted $199,370 and that's everything to operate the hydros, including labor, equipment, materials. Year to date, we were at 135,000. Um, that was year to date, so we'll probably be close to our budgeted number of about $200,000 to operate. So looking, looking at this uh, so far, just in the uh, 2010 to 2016, it's projected that there would be roughly a half a million dollars of revenue produced. <clears throat> Correct. If we were to uh, not have the dams in place, not only would we not have that half a million dollar revenue, but we would have to, in turn, buy a half a million or more in, in extra power to serve the community. Generally, yeah, that, I, that, that would be correct. So it's, it's really uh, really kind of a, a double whammy there. You, you're not only bringing in revenue, but you're spending more to, to service the community by having to purchase more power. And I think it's certainly a fair statement to, to if you look at the, the number of, you know, the $450,000, that's not the entirety of, of what you would, um, what the cost might be to the city. Thank you. <clears throat> but I'm kind of confused. We on the chart before we had approximately sixty-five thousand dollars per year for the last seven years, and before then it was even lower than that. I'll but now back. we make a pretty Here. big jump. Um, that what we're. I just want to bring the chart up. So this one. Yeah, that we're. Yep. You know. I don't know, average that out, it's probably $75,000 a year. Um, and then the other thing that kind of sticks out a little bit, I mean, um, I don't know the intent of this graph, if it was meant to be just a, a diagram to see pluses and minuses, but, you know, the two expenses there, um, I understand you lo you're losing about $80,000 of revenue and then $20,000 worth of uh, law or negative, so adds up to $100,000 a year, but, but our licensing fee and our, uh, you know, got to jump ahead, we'll see these numbers, but they're considerably higher than those. I think th that's what those two bars represent, yes. so. Yeah, the assumption there was $150,000 a year for two years offset by the, the, uh, the operation that would still be occurring of the two hydros. And then we tried to stay a little bit conservative in terms of what the output uh, was. We're getting better than, than we're showing on here currently. Yeah, um, but I mean. It's I, just a projection. I, I see the licensing estimate at 290,000 and, uh, and then the construction project with all of the extra cost overhead is 464,000. Yes considerably more than what's shown on that graph. One thing I think to help us a little bit with these, some of these decisions is if, if those numbers were, were converted to present value, I mean, you know, we're, we're gonna be talking about a pretty high number to take these dams out, yes. but that's a, pre, you know, that's present, present value. Present value. The, the value of all this income and expense would be could be converted to present value yeah. also great would help okay would would help maybe clarify what what these numbers really mean right. good now that's def definitely something that we can we can do I'll jump ahead here. So we're going to talk a little bit about the relicensing process. And, <coughs> and Leslie, this might be uh, a little bit of a wake-up. Make sure you're still there. So again, appreciate you hanging on the phone uh, tonight. 
<laughs> great. Okay. We'll get a we'll get a mic over to you as well. Uh, so a couple of the kind of the high points as we look at the schedule here. The deadline uh, to update the pre-application document or the pad as as you probably come to know it, and to notify FERC of whatever the city is going to do is August 31st of of next year. So we're working towards that. And why it seems like it's a, a ways away, it's it's coming up pretty quick. Um, the final license or surrender uh, for the the facilities that application is due by August 31st of 2021 and what happens in that period of time is preparation of the application. There's a lot of different technical studies, some that are very well defined, some that we don't know yet. It will depend on uh, various stakeholders and agency requests and information. So it's a little bit difficult to predict what is everything that's gonna go on, much less the cost of you know what that's gonna be. That's why you see some different numbers there. But it's about two years worth of study uh, and then another two years of Review. So once you turn in the license application, FERC has two years um, on or before August 31st of 2023 before they would either issue a new license or approve the surrender application. So no matter what uh, in the process that, that we go through with FERC, the, the point of the of showing the schedule is there's, there's a lot of work and, and it's drawn out over a period of time. Um, and, and so it will take some time and some patience as, as we work through that process. Um, in October, the City Council narrowed the options that uh, the committee was going to look at and we were going to be bringing to the Utility Board uh, and ultimately to the Council as well. Uh, we wanted to narrow that down. We started um, with your group and I believe that was probably in December of 2014 with as many as five options. That included the license extension that you ultimately followed. Uh, as recently as this summer, we talked about four options. There was, uh, there was three scenarios, but an A and a B. And so we really wanted to try to simplify things. And so those scenarios are, number one, relicense both Junction Falls, the upper, and Powell Falls, the lower facility. Scenario two is to surrender the license for both facilities. And then uh, the scenario three is to relicense and keep Junction Falls. It's in great shape. It's operating for you right now. And to consider removing Powell Falls. It's gonna need some, some work uh, that you're gonna have to put into it. And so one of the considerations would be, do you keep one, continue to operate that, and remove the other, and, and restore that segment of, of uh, the Kinney below Junction Falls. So let's talk just really quickly about each of those scenarios. So in scenario one, keeping both facilities, the city would prepare and submit an application um, to operate uh, into the future. And recently, uh, FERC has gone and, and changed their guidelines in the past. Um, that has been a 30-year license Right now, uh, typical license is going to be for 40 years, and that's something that's changed just uh, in the end of October. Uh, and so that's one of the things to, that's going to be uh, a consideration as we go forward. In that case, both dams would remain in place. You'd continue to generate power. But the point of emphasis here is even if you have the facilities and generating equipment, you're not required to generate electricity. You're not mandated to do it. The license allows you to generate electricity, and so that's your ability, your, your choice and decision to do that. Um, the dam safety inspections uh, for the existing dams that would continue, it would still fall under the purview of FERC, not the Department of Natural Resources, but that work would still be done, It'd be regular inspections to make sure they're kept up to date uh, and that they're operated in a safe condition. So, okay. yep. Interrupt one more time. No, um, please. Maybe several more times. Um, <laughs> you know, what, what is the, expected life of these dams um you know can will his do, do we have history that they they can last indefinitely if they're maintained um or as or is there at some point in time they'll have to be removed and rebuilt or well the, i think it's fair to say that at some point in time they definitely need need to have some work done um the uh, the original dam that's in the in place of uh, junction falls right now i believe was built in about 1920 i think is the uh, is the original construction and then that that served the city until uh 1990 when it was when it was actually rehabbed uh and that was a refacing so they didn't have to take the dam down there was a significant amount of work done uh to to bring it up to to current uh, codes and to current operation, but so 70 years, the history of that would probably be the best thing that you can take a look at. 
We are assuming 50 year useful life as we put some financial projections together, but they're concrete structures with water. Um, they can last a, a, a very long time. Uh, there's not a lot of moving parts. It's the equipment that probably needs to be looked at a little bit more often than the dams themselves. Uh, looking back at the history, you know, the, the city has had dams for a long time, and, and those dams were a lot more susceptible to, to storms and wash out. Uh, but as I mentioned, the, the current structure that's in place has been, uh, has been there uh, for a long time. So they can last 50 years or longer. Thank you. So scenario two involves removal of both facilities. And again, in this case, it starts with a no notification to FERC, in this case, that you want to surrender the license, you want to give up the license. Uh, and then would go through really and, and start to uh, talk about removal and a list of studies and restoration plans that would be uh, necessary to do that. In the case of a surrender uh, with FERC, that's usually a more involved process than it is in a relicensing. And, and the reason is, is with removal, you're changing conditions. You're changing downstream conditions. There's more things that need to be studied. What is going to be, what's the impact going to be of more sediment and, and the positive impact perhaps uh, on thermal conditions. But all of those things are change. And so when FERC looks at um, relicensing, that's maintaining the status quo from the standpoint of what's, what's downstream. That's how FERC views that. Uh, in a relicense, because it's changed, there's going to be more studies that, uh, that would have to address that. Once uh, FERC approves the uh, surrender application, then uh, the city would discontinue the hydro operations. You wouldn't operate after that. So you would be able to operate up until the time that you receive the, the approval of that application. Well, that's a great question. Let, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to throw that one to, to Leslie. Leslie, did you hear the question? I did not hear it at all. Yeah, Please so the, quest, the question is, what happens if FERC does not approve the surrender application? Um, well, if FERC doesn't approve the surrender application, um, the city could then either um, basically move into relicensing, if that's what FERC is suggesting, or uh, I guess there's a number of reasons why they wouldn't approve it or scenarios. So. It depends on why they don't approve it. So if they're not re approving it because um, they think the removal would somehow damage the existing conditions, um, even whether you're doing a relicensing or a surrender, FERC will do a full environmental analysis to look at the conditions of the site. Um, so one reason they could be doing, they could say no would be, um, you know, they think it would damage the existing natural area. Another reason for no, because they could say that the projects are too valuable, we want to see if another entity is willing to own and operate the project, or they might know of one that's willing to own and operate the project, a, a group could have come forward to say, hey, we want we want to take this over. Um, and FERC's, FERC's role is basically, um, it's with licensing and maintaining safety, but it's also generation of power. So the way they look at it is a little bit different as well. If someone's applying for surrender, most of the time, they're, they're going to say yes, um, but it is possible that they could say no. So lastly, this is Kevin again. I was going to ask the follow-up question to you. So has there been many scenarios where the uh, community has been denied a relicense? Did you hear that question? I did. Um, no, sometimes it can take a very long time. FERC likes ideally everyone to be in agreement, so if there's a lot of um, community or stakeholder agency opposition. FERC really likes those things to be worked out ahead of time. Um, that said, depending on the licensing process that's used, FERC can come in and act as a decision maker um, for projects and basically, you know, rule in one one decision or the other to keep the process moving. Um, so, you know, mo for the most part, most of the time, if you're if you're applying for a license, it's most often that you are able to receive it. Usually it's kind of a process to make sure the needs of the community and the stakeholders and the agencies are being met, more so than a, you know, a hard yes or no at the end. Most of the time the answer is yes. Yeah, I was going to say, I, from my dealings with FERC, I think they're, uh, they're a facilitator of the process, and they're a facilitator to get to yes is their main goal. And I suppose there could be snags along the way, but if I couched that, Leslie, and said that FERC is a facilitator for uh, dam license holders to get to yes, that's probably pretty accurate uh, assessment. 
Leslie, do you think? They're usually not too actively involved. They're more of a, I guess, a decision maker. They really kind of put the, the responsibility of, of doing the, the consultation and community outreach on the licensee. And if you come to them and say, hey, we're all still in disagreement, they might throw it back at you and say, okay, come back to me when, when you can all come to agreement. Um, or, again, depending on which process you're using, they might just, you know, come in and make the decision for you and say, okay, this is what it is, and we're going to keep moving forward based on, what that decision is. An example of that could be if um, you know a certain entity was requesting a water quality study, and the city of River Falls really didn't want to do it. Um, FERC could come in and say, yes, do it, or, or no, don't do it. So that's something where they would come in during the process. If, for example, with the relicensing scenario, you were using the integrated licensing process where they're more involved. Perfect. Thank you. And a follow-up question. Um, if the decision is not to relicense. Do the dams have to be removed? Uh, the short answer is no. If you decide to relicense, they uh, or to not relicense, it, it, again, it's going to depend on how the uh, how the decision is made and what other stipulations are added to the decision. But it's, you're not mandated to remove the dams just because you decide to not relicense. You'd, you'd be letting the license go, which is your ability to generate electricity. But but we would have to maintain the dams. Hold on, Leslie. We had t hold on, Les Leslie. Hold on, Tim Tum, uh, our board member, has one question. Then Leslie, I'll, I'll let you go. Tim, I assume we would we still have the obligation to maintain the dams in a safe uh, <coughs> position. A absolutely, yes. Leslie, do you have any more to add to that? Yeah. If you um, so, if you submit for surrender you would very need you know clearly need to lay out what the plan is for surrender what that looks like um you can't just go to FERC and say we want to surrender and that's all the information you give them you would need to provide a detailed timeline of if you want to surrender and keep facilities in place or if you want to surrender and remove the dams either remove one dam or both dam both dams and if you're doing that um you know what would that look like um there's a lot of information that they need to know because FERC is evaluating it from its current condition. So they need to know what all the changes would be. So they might, so they would, you know, you'd likely need some pretty detailed studies to, to look at what would happen when one or both facilities were removed if you're removing. Um, so regardless of, you know, whatever the option you choose, you're going to need to provide a good amount of detail to FERC in order for them to approve it and not keep coming back at you with questions. Very good. I, I've actually got a quick question for her, too. Um, Leslie, have you encountered a municipality that has surrendered their license and then subsequently another entity came in and relicensed those facilities that they just surrendered the license on? That is, that is possible. So if when you submit surrender application, um, FERC has the ability to advertise the project. Um, regardless, it's, it's noticed in the public register that you submitted a surrender application um, and FERC can either just you know publish it there and just kind of let it go knowing that you want to um, knowing what your plans are whether you want to leave them there in place or if you want to remove them um, or they could choose to more actively advertise the project and actually go out and try to seek another entity to take over ownership and operation of the project okay along, thank you along those lines thank you if 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 it's the decision of the city council to not seek relicensing and remove the dams FERC will honor that more than likely is that correct and that i understand Most they don't have to if you so when you submit a surrender application uh, you very clearly need to detail what that would look like and if FERC knows that the city wants to surrender with the goal of removing one or both facilities they're more likely to honor that but it's you know, based on how the regulations are written, they're not required to. But more likely than not, they would. Thank you. Scenario three? Yes. <laughs> so the last scenario that we, we talked about, and again, these are the three scenarios that uh, the, the council has asked that we, we evaluate, would be to remove Powell Falls and to keep Junction Falls in place. 
In order to do that, you would be recommending a relicensing. So you're extending your ability to generate electricity, but you're then deciding as part of that application to only do it at Junction Falls. And then ultimately you would include as part of that application your interest in, in uh, removing uh, the lower uh, the dam, the powerhouse, all the equipment, and, and then whatever restoration would, would go along with that. Um, again, like, the, like scenario one, the dam safety and inspections would still be uh, part of what you'd be expected to do, but going forward for the next period of time, um, that would again be defined in the license. You would be uh, able to, not required, but able to generate electricity at Junction Falls, uh, and then the lower part of the river, basically from the South Fork, uh, and below would would be restored uh, to to some condition. So the the next couple slides really just get into a, a few of the fine points in terms of the the relicensing, the pros and cons, and and I, I think rather than reading through each of these, you can see there's a there's a balance in in all of these. There's not a an obvious choice necessarily from the, the advantages of relicensing versus the disadvantages as you go through. Uh, there's a, an ability to, to have electricity from renewable energy. There's an interest in, in being able to do a, a restoration. And so you can, you can see that, that not only on the relicensing but also on the surrender side, there's a, again a, a, a number of benefits and a number of things to consider in each of these cases. So it's, it's a, a number of things to, to weigh as we go forward and start to consider what, what are the best uh, options available to the city, where are the, the least risks uh, going forward, and, and what's going to best uh, meet with what we've been hearing uh, from the community over the, uh, I want to say the last year, but it's longer than that, longer period of time, certainly. Questions about, about those slides? Uh, This slide is a question we, we've heard a lot and it probably through most of the tech talks. If we surrender or if we relicense now, can we surrender and remove at a later date? And the short answer to that is yes. Um, it, it certainly comes with, with some caveats like a lot of the, the answers. It would be nice if it was completely black and white. Um, in a case that if you decide to relicense now and then you want to surrender at a later date, you can do that, but then you will have to go through a surrender process. So much like the process we're talking about now, just moves that down the road. So whenever you would decide, okay, we're done, uh, maybe Junction Falls gets to a point in its useful life that it needs a lot of work and you don't want to put the capital uh, cost into that any longer and you decide let's go through a surrender process. So you'd still have to do the studies and all of, the inf all of those things that we're talking about today, it would just be down the road a, a bit. So it does give you that flexibility. Some may be wondering, is a surrender process more cumbersome than a relicense process? Yeah, so in, in general, we believe that the, the surrender process is more, is more involved. And again, I mentioned a little bit earlier, there's more things that are going to change if you remove dams than would uh, if you left them in place. So today it's predictable. You, you know what you have. You understand the flow. You understand the water quality and the temperature and the sediment. So that, uh, that's not going to change in a relicensing. In a surrender, all of that changes. Uh, and you would need to be able to document that and, and be able to to show that it's not going to be detrimental change, but it's going to be a, a positive condition and be restored in a way that it would be positive. So it is. It would be more involved. Can I say that the process is more well defined in the FERC regulations? It's actually incredibly detailed and, and defined in the FERC regulations. Um, but surrender is definitely uh, more of a, a gray area. There's not a really well defined process for surrender. Um, you're certainly required to co consult with agencies and stakeholders and, and work with FERC throughout the process. Um, but it's a little bit more of a question mark of exactly what agency stakeholders and ultimately FERC would require in order to get to the, the answer of yes, go ahead and, and surrender. Uh, uh, Leslie, so how much, you know, FERC does respond to stakeholder groups and requests for studies. So. How much weight does FERC give uh, stakeholder groups in determining what studies need to be completed? Um, they, they listen to everybody. They, I say they give the most weight probably to the federal agencies because it's, you know, you know, like federal agencies. So um, they, they do certainly listen to everybody. And um, as I mentioned before, they like, they like it when the licensee comes to them with an answer of, 
of yes and everybody agreeing ahead of time if possible. Um, if that's not possible, you know, they're, they're certainly looking at the concerns of all stakeholders, agencies, whether they're, they're state or federal, and taking that into consideration. Um, FERC does have a lot of experts on their staff as well, whether it's, um, you know, fisheries, water quality, recreation, that will use their experience based on other projects and just, you know, their experience working in the hydro industry and, and helping to make those final decisions. Thank you. So one of the considerations certainly is the cost to relicense and cost to surrender. So before I go through the, the, the detail here, one of the, one of the issues with really getting to, to hard numbers right now is that there's no design. And so there's not even a preliminary design of what would removal look like if we were able to do that. That said, we have a, a resource, a very good report that actually was put together uh, by the Friends of the Kinney and their consultant Interfluve, some very good numbers. And so we felt that those were uh, reasonable numbers to rely on as we look, to, look forward to, to at least put some estimates together on not only what would removal look like, but also the other two scenarios. Uh, we tried to break the cost estimate down here into a couple parts. So at the very top you see um, dam removal for Junction Falls, dam removal for Powell Falls. Under keeping both, uh, so scenario one, keeping both, there's no cost, of course, to, to be able to, there's no removal. Um, and remove both, um, there's a cost of, uh, of about $500,000 for Junction Falls and a, and a little bit lower cost for Powell. It's a smaller facility. Under keeping Junction Falls, there's just a removal cost for the Powell Falls option. And so that's, that's kind of why you see different numbers in different categories. As you go through each of the three options, we've totaled it in a couple places. So as you near the bottom, you'll see estimated construction cost. We've used the numbers that are available from reports like the Friends of the Kinney uh, and, and other available information to come up with an estimated construction cost, and then we've applied a contingency because there is no preliminary design in place, and we've added about 30 percent to those costs. Uh, that number is actually a little bit lower than the contingency that was included in the Friends of the Kinney report that was a plus or minus 50 percent. We think their numbers are, are a little better than that, and so we're comfortable from that standpoint. We've also added a contingency to include things like legal and engineering and administrative costs and, and fiscal uh, expenses. There's overhead to be able to, to go forward with, with any construction project, and 30 percent is pretty typical on, on most municipal projects. And that gets us to the line that's called base project costs. That's where you can first start looking at kind of the capital expense. These are 2017 dollars uh, from keeping both facilities uh, to removing both facilities or to keeping just Junction Falls. Uh, lastly, we, we have a line that says licensing and permitting. That's where there's some variation. And it's not just the FERC cost. There's also overlapping uh, regulatory authority with the Department of Natural Resources. So there's other permits besides just getting FERC approval, depending on which direction we go and, and if there's a restoration, how that's done, and get into wetland issues and floodplain issues that all have to be resolved and gone through uh, permitting issues. Adding those up, the, the total base project right now uh, would be about $750,000 for keeping both uh, just over $8 million for removing both. And you may remember there was, a, we had an initial number of about $12 million this summer. We've been able to fine tune that a little bit. And, and so it's still a big number, but it's, it's not the, the number that we showed this summer. It's a little bit smaller. And then the third option, the third scenario, about $2 million for keeping Junction Falls and removing Powell Falls, primarily because we have a, we have a removal and, and some other work that has to be done in that scenario. So. Questions about the, the costs um, as we've presented it here. We've tried to break it down in a, in a simple way. There's more detail behind it, but you know, I'll emphasize for the third time, uh, to really get good and hard numbers, you're going to have to get into at least some preliminary design um, to, to, get, you know, to start moving those contingencies smaller as we go forward. Yeah, I was just going to add on to that and say this, this uh, chart here really is you know, for magnitude in context, I don't, you know, the exact numbers are going to be give or take, like I said, 30 percent. But this is more for magnitude of con in context of saying, well, what if we keep them both? What if we take them both out? And what if we keep one? It kind of gives you a flavor for the difference in those scenarios. So, so the upstream or the steam stream restoration uh, upstream of Junction Falls or between Powell Falls and Junction Falls. 
just a little bit of uh, explanation what those what those numbers might include. So some of the some of the, the smaller numbers in there would be things like excavation, channel stabilization, uh, there's seeding, there's planting, there would be, uh, w there may be rocks that are actually placed in the stream to create habitat. Um, and so it would be all of those things. Uh, in some dam removals and things that you'll, you'll see in literature or, or other examples where they've removed the dam and then they simply let the, let the water flush out the, the sediment. And we know we can't do that. We have a, we have a class one, trout stream uh, that's just downstream and just upstream you know, of, the, of the reservoirs as we, as we talk about them. I and we can't just release the sediment. So it's not quite as simple as just letting it go. We need to, to slowly draw them down. And then the, the effort really is to restore the stream, create a stream bank um, that's going to have, not, it's not only going to be stable during storm events, and the kinney is pretty flashy in a storm event, uh, but it's also going to produce habitat and, and then some of the other considerations would be access and, and if for people to be able to, to view or walk along and, and those types of things beyond that. But, uh, but you know, we, we had, uh, we were given a presentation last month <coughs> about development scenarios. Uh, um, these, do these numbers include any of, any of those uh, finer detail stuff? I no, I think this not. is, I think this is, uh, Correct me if I'm wrong, Mark, but I believe this is more of the bare bones restoration. Yes. And there are other ideas out there for what that could be, including, you know, kayak landings and parks and all that stuff. That would be in addition to the basic restoration, which is basically shown here. Is yeah, there's correct? no recreational amenities built in uh, into so, these costs at all. So some of the scenarios that you saw with some things that were a little more extravagant, those numbers are not included in the 554. This is basic stream restoration numbers sure so one last question mm -hmm. then for the infrastructure modifications now i i understand the 275,000 for keeping both and the 25,000 for keeping junction falls but the 2.3 million for removing both i don't i um i haven't been able to piece together sure. what that number might include yeah, so great question. Uh, a, a couple things to, to think about as the, as Junction Falls in particular, as the dam would come out uh, and, and the river began to kind of find its normal channel, the, the level of the river in the vicinity of the dam is going to drop about 15 feet. Uh, the, in, under normal flow uh, conditions coming through uh, that area right around the Winter Street Bridge, the water in a normal day may only be uh, six inches to a foot deep. It's, it's a steep section, it's, and so it's going to flow through there, and it's going to be a lot lower than it is today. The dam raises the water level. When we do that, it's going to expose the, the center pier of the bridge. And while we don't think it's uh, unstable structurally, uh, the, the bridge is built on a concrete seal. It's about 11 feet in height. It was, it was placed when the sediment was was uh, already there when, when they built the Winter Street Bridge. And so there's structural evaluations that need to be done, and so we need to account for um, what might have to happen to, to not only stabilize the pier if, if we do think it's got structural problems, but also make sure that as trees or other debris might come down the, the river in a storm event that it, it's gonna be stable and, and not uh, have a big root mass, uh, you know, start to damage the, the pier. We have two more bridges as we go upstream. We have the, the pedestrian bridge that, that, while that really isn't a risk from a structural standpoint, the aesthetics of those piers are gonna be exposed. So right now it looks kind of like stone above the water level, um, but it doesn't go all the way down to the, to the natural channel bedrock. So there's work that it would have to be done there. We've accounted uh, for some potential work as well at Maple Street. And then we start getting into the utility crossings. There's a, a handful of sanitary sewer crossings, uh, water main crossings that would need to be evaluated. Again, this is sort of part of that design process. We know they're there. We, it would be uh, wise to at least account for expenses that are going to relate to that. And then lastly, a lot of the storm sewer outfalls that, uh, that in the downtown area drop into the river, those would need to be either extended so they continue to reach the bank once the, the river narrows through uh, Lake George or Lake Louise. Uh, or they would need to be uh, collected in stormwater treatment, which is not included in this option, uh, but modifications would still be necessary to, to be able to do that. So those, that's kind of the, 
the range of things. There's a, a number of unknowns uh, until we can get a little bit further into what does restoration look like and we can evaluate each and every utility crossing and a, and a much more in-depth look at uh, each of the bridges as an example. But that's what's incorporated in there. We've also included a little bit uh, of budget to account for uh, mitigation that if there's wetlands that are lost, so as the reservoirs recede, we may actually have to do mitigation. We may have to create some wetland and another area as part of the permitting uh, and approval process. So we have to account for that now. So that's included in there as well. So in terms of schedule, we talked a little bit about this uh, up front in terms of sort of what the submission schedule was. Uh, February 28th is really what we've set to be able to have a, a decision so that we are able to, uh, to communicate with FERC. The sooner we can do that, the better. And, to, and so either in, in either option, whether we're licensing or whether it's a surrender, um, that deadline is the same. By August, as I mentioned, August of 2018, we would be either submitting a notice of intent uh, and the pre-application to FERC for relicensing, or we'd be submitting a notice of surrender to, to FERC in a surrender situation. In 2019 and 2020, that I mentioned up front, there's studies, there's gonna be at least two years of studies. So some of it will be around the infrastructure, some will be around, uh, certainly around the environment, but a, a number of things have to be done. And then a final license application or a surrender application, which would be on or before August 31st of 2021. So. Again, we've been at this a while. You, you've been talking about it uh, for a number of, of years already, uh, and you can see it's gonna extend out uh, and be on some future agendas here as well. Um, and then ultimately the license uh, or a surrender approval would occur in 2023. So that's looking out a ways, but that's kind of what's out in front of us uh, as we look at it. So in terms of what's next, a number of meetings that are still coming up this Thursday, the, the corridor committee is meeting again. They'll be discussing you know, their preliminary decision uh, around the, the relicensing or surrender. They've started uh, that process. We're gonna continue that dialogue and, uh, and, and kind of the collaboration really between the, the committee and the utility board. Uh, January 11th, we have another committee meeting and the focus there uh, primarily will be on a report that will ultimately be going to council and, and getting kind of a final read. We'll be back here on January 15th. We'll be talking uh, again about uh, a final decision. There'll be a, a resolution that would be part of the packet uh, as we go forward or a, a couple resolutions so that you have an opportunity to, to be able to make uh, that recommendation. Uh, and the recommendation in that case um, will be going back to the committee and the com committee ultimately will make the recommendation to city council. Uh, so on January 25th, the committee meets again. That's when they'll finalize their recommendation. Council will receive the report on the 13th of February and then on February 27th would be the, the discussion of what the final decision would be. So a lot, a lot of dates, a, a lot of activity here in the next, uh, in the next two months to, to get up to that date. In the packet, I know there was a, a copy of the draft resolution. And Kevin, I, I don't know if, uh, how you want to cover that this yeah, evening. Yeah, I mean, it's in there again. It's just a draft just to get you thinking about the scenarios and what we're talking about tonight. There's a lot of factual things in that draft resolution right now. It doesn't get too juicy till the very end of that. So uh, the first we left part's that part pretty blank. standard, pretty boilerplate. <laughs> and then uh, really, it's going to be an open dialogue. And tonight, too, I mean, our discussion has started. You folks are asking the right questions. But we want to start getting this in the funnel, right? We want to know what you're thinking so we can begin to draft that. But between now and then, you know, the corridor uh, committee is going to meet, and then we're going to meet here again the 15th. But, you know, we're going to have to start thinking about which direction you want to go. And, again, we'll probably have several scenarios ready for you to choose from for that meeting on the 15th. So, And I, and I still hope we have some more dialogue yet tonight, too, more questions if you have them. So, Well, uh, <clears throat> So finally, we you know we, we see some numbers here and compare. So what else would you like between now and the 15th? Well, yeah. um, how how would we finance eight million dollars? Mm -hmm. Our finance directors here. <laughs> <laughs> I wanted to do that too. Very. <laughs> you, you bring the checkbook out. <laughs> well, obviously, we don't have eight million dollars in the in the fund to just yeah. take care of. Uh, Couple of bands, so um, you know we will have to tackle that question. I, yeah. I, well, I would think that we would have to bond 
for some of that? Right. So that would just say too. So if there was a decision to go ahead and do that immediately, I mean, somebody would have to, we'd have to bond for at least well, so, a portion so, of the eight million dollars. So would if you average, were to go ahead and do that? So would the average resident of River Falls uh, be have a uh, property tax assessment? And uh, <clears throat> you know, I mean, as anybody, what 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 are what are what's that? number look like a couple things one it depends where that money came from if it came from the utilities which in may then it would be a rate impact um there's also you know possible grants and funds out there to that you know you hear about but you never know till the money gets here right but uh if this was a utility expense which it may be since it's a hydroelectric facility and dams it you know if you were to do that all in one chunk i mean that's a rate expense it's an expense of the utility which could have, could have an impact on rates and if it wasn't a utility expense and it was a general fund expense, then it would be a taxpayer burden. But but the bottom line is somebody's going to pay for it. It's Correct. going to be the taxpayer, whether it's Correct. a general fund or a, or a, a <coughs> higher priced utilities. Correct. Correct. I guess the I, the general public should at least have an idea of what that individual impact would be. I mean, um, I'm, I'm for really nice things too but uh. well that's good i mean that that's a good question i mean mark that's something i've made a note already but you know what would eight million dollars uh, today have on a potential rate impact i see al scratching notes as well but that's i think the the other challenge as we go forward and again that it, it's having to, to make some tough decisions without having all of the information to, to the level of detail we'd like that is the first question. well uh, understood but the the challenge is is that depending on the scenarios there is a different uh, there are different funding sources, as Kevin said, that, that may be available to help offset some of the city's costs. So then when you try to put that into a scenario and, and say, well, what would that be to a rate payer or to a taxpayer? It's going to depend on whether you're successful in getting some of those grants. Um, but there, there are funds, depending on which option that you're looking at, that would help offset some costs. They're not going to pay for it, and the city's still going to have its own match. But, but I uh, think in reality, you need to look at it like you're not going to get those funds. I, that's a, a fair and if, way. If you get them, that's that's fine. Correct. Secondly, um, you know, on a project this big, let's say you decide to take both of them out, there's a lot of tiff there. Things I forgot, and you know it's going to cost more than what we looked at tonight. Right. Again, the challenge mm -hmm. is that we we won't be able to put a a, a specific number that says here's the amount of tax increase or the amount of rate increase and I, I think what we probably are able to do is talk about what are the different funding tools that would be available uh, that would and then we mentioned it earlier in the meeting too but just to, since we're talking about funding and money I mean then you're also losing those avoided costs that you are generating by, gener by, ha by having the generation of the electricity as well so it's just it's just a, not a large piece but it's another piece of it so. It's like, uh, you know, having par ideas in parks or anything. I mean, we have to find a way to fund those things, right? And then the decision of the policymakers have to make the hard decisions of how to fund things people want. And you do it over time. You do it in one bite. And how do you get the money? So you're thinking they're all along the right lines. Um, I, I've had some conversations with people in the Hudson School District. This is just an example. They, they passed a $93 million referendum recently, which makes eight sound small. Um, and I've talked to property owners who are um, absolutely disgusted and some who are thrilled at the new facilities. And, you know, our, our job is just to, to, I guess, to put it in a quote, find the will of the town of River Falls on this matter. Um, I'm just concerned that we really do get as much information as possible. You know, that we, grants are great and that's fine, but the more real numbers we can have as to likely tax impact i mean th the boring numbers uh the more of those <laughs> we get important. the better um and I, I appreciate the work that multiple groups have done i think we do have a lot of information but the better job we can do at getting more the, the better decision we'll make so that was a conversation i was having at dinner tonight that people do get interested when they discover the impact on them whether positive or negative and then the interest usually ramps up other questions 
think that's it. Okay. Well, I appreciate the, the time. We'll be back uh, in January to see you all. So thank you. Thanks a lot, Mark. Thank you very much. I appreciate it. Leslie, uh, thank you, too, uh, for uh, being there tonight. Some valuable comments, Leslie. Thank you. Thank you. All right, you. So, you know, we have a month and we have some holidays in between now and then and some meetings. Uh, how would this board like to proceed? How would you like me to craft language? I know you need more information. Um, would it be okay if I brought uh, those three scenarios and three different uh, resolutions? Is that how you want me to proceed to come to the 15th of January meeting? Is that probably fair? And then we, you can massage the ideas between now and then, talk to your neighbors, talk to the community, um, ask more questions, and we'll bring more numbers then for you on the 15th as well to some of your points, Tim. Will we have numbers on the, uh, the, the, the Caney Restoration or the, I don't know, what, what do we uh, call it? On the other items, or, the, yeah. the ancillary items? Yeah, um, yeah I mean, those. Mark, do we ever come up with numbers on some of those scenarios that we came up with in the charrette? Yeah, so I, I think you, you may be referring to the presentation from, from last month where yeah, they from showed Bob a Cost's couple different presentation scenarios. We, we showed the three different possibilities of... We, we've put some general costs together. We, we kind of picked a, a, a middle-of-the-road version f as an example for, for Lake George. You probably saw kind of a, 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 an Eco Park uh, version and then probably a very elaborate Central Park app option and something in between. And it put some numbers to that. Uh, again, the, the challenge really is to, you know, do you do that with all scenarios or one scenario? And so that's why you saw even in the estimate where we called it the base project. All of the, the other things that you do uh, from stormwater to recreation facilities are, are all going to be uh, a choice that you can make a, a, another decision. Uh, and so we were, the reason that those numbers really haven't come forward and we haven't gone through it in any detail really with the committee either is that it, it's somewhat independent of the decision. Uh, we can, if there's some direction that you'd like to see more numbers, we can talk about the best way to, to share that at the next meeting. So we, we have put some of those together, but uh, there's not a lot of difference between the three scenarios depending yeah. on what yeah. you do. But uh, so, you know, I, I'll agree Lake George isn't real attractive right now. Um, I think several years ago, we, when we kind of started this, there was a, a presentation about, uh, you know, the sediment that's there and and you know I, th I saw some numbers you know they were thinking we could remove not 10 percent of it something like that uh, and leave 90 percent there but basically said you know pretty much it's going to be invasive species that are going to be growing in that mm -hmm. and so then you wonder well you know what's that going to look like is that going to be a a, a a prize if you don't spend the additional money which we don't really know what that number is right. uh, before it's really going to look like any any major improvement right. I, I don't know Absolutely. I'm just asking oh. kind of uh, you know if that's um, you know I could sit there for 10 years the the river is in its banks but it's high head high weeds and stuff getting down to it I don't you know yeah, if you spend eight million on taking the dams out you may not have any money left to do the niceties around it has there been any studies or thoughts about taking our existing situation and, and improving that and uh, yes different? yeah we on the committee we've been talking about that because then been, you know then the three million dollars out of the eight million could be spent on improving what we've got, and so then we, you know, it, it'd be. It just seems to make more sense to mm -hmm. me. So you, you correct me if I'm wrong, Mark, but I sensed a conversation kind of going that way at our last Kinney Corridor meeting, where maybe we talked to maybe about an interim type scenario where you kind of are moving towards uh, a dam removal at some point in time. In the interim, you're kind of producing something that maybe is heading in that direction but not a full-blown dam removal and restoration is kind of an in-between process you know uh, dredge it out create a channel something nice that that if the dam comes out that 
could mainly stay? Is that what we kind of discussed, Mark? Uh, I, kind I, of in, a, in general, kind of an in I think between, kind of a kind of a headed that direction type uh, scenario. If, if if at all, but quite preliminary. I mean, it's, it certainly came up, but but that came up as a in a right. conversation. And I think that's the, the that's the the detail, the caveats that you want to think about as the as you think about the three scenarios. Is okay. I kind of like this scenario along with these uh, these conditions, and I think that that's part of what's going to happen. I, I don't know that as we look at it, it's, it's, it's not an easy decision no matter what, but to be able to just say it's A, B, or C. It's, it's A with these things, or B under this schedule or condition. And I, I think those are the things that we're going to want to think about and would, would ultimately be part of a, of a resolution of, you know, in, in terms of your recommendation, we'll be saying the same things to the committee, uh, that it's, you know, what are the other things? Um, or the you know you know what's the what's the fairway that uh, that you're going to define along with it so or maybe a way to think about it what is the incremental approach well the, you know obviously the numbers we have here taking the Powell dam out is much lower cost mm -hmm. um, I just I don't know I was going to ask this before and I didn't but uh, we had you had pros and cons for scenario one and two but there wasn't any pros and cons for scenario three which is removing one and keeping one just wondering if you know is it worth an exercise to think about the, yeah, the, yeah. Certainly yeah. I, I, think I mean they might be very similar yeah. to but. if if i may yes, um uh, you asked us what we'd like to see i'd like to see some more information about um how removing the dams would affect um stormwater drainage um uh, if we've got some information on that um, and I'd also like to make a, a bit of a comment as to how I see our role here on uh, the Utility Advisory Board. I think my understanding is it's coming to us at this stage um, before even the uh, Kinney committees made a recommendation um, to get our feedback because we, it, it involves the dams, which involve the utilities, and we've got a special relationship to that. Um, so I, I don't think we'll ever have the numbers that we want, um, but that our goal is to uh, take a look and balance all the factors um, given that we report to um, essentially the ratepayers uh, as well as the rest of the citizens of River Falls. How do we see this as a utility board? Um, as for funding, the council will um, decide that, decide how, decide when, decide how fast. Um, so, uh, but they would look to us for a decision um, based more on what we know about the utility because we know a lot more than they do. So. Well, I think, but I think funding has to be part of our decision because uh, it, it, if our interest is operation of the utility, um, if the utility becomes encumbered by an $8 million or $10 million project, that definitely affects how this utility is going to operate. And that's our, our responsibility to work with that. So I, I think we have to look at the numbers in making our decision. Anything else tonight? A lot to think about over your holiday meals. Thank you. Thank you. Moving on to the reports, which would be the finance report, utility dashboards, and the monthly utility report. Our finance director, Al Rolick, is here to give the report. Good evening, board members. I have a brief report to give you on the financial situation with the utility funds. Um, as of the end of November of this year, um, revenues to date in the uh, electric fund are 12.7 million. This is about 281,000 over the year before, so sales are up. Um, the utility right now is spent about 86% of its annual budget. Um, right now, at, as of the end of November, we're looking at a surplus of, of about $147,000. Um, cash and investment reserves total $5.5 million at the end of November. And the year-to-date kilowatt purchases are $110 million 
uh, kilowatts plus a hybrid generation adds about 1.9 million to that figure for a total of 112,324,000 kilowatt hours. The utility recognizes 110 million kilowatt hours consumption for about a 2.01% loss year to date in 2017. And this is stable with 2016 at 2.08, so it's about the same. Uh, the water fund has a year-to-date revenues of 2.1 million. This is an increase of about $425,000 over the previous year. Um, the utility has spent about 84% of its budget year-to-date. Uh, as of the end of November, uh, it is standing with a surplus of about $452,000, so it's performing well. Um, the cash and investments reserves uh, as of the end of November is $1.6 million. And year-to-date gallons pumped are about 370 million gallons. Uh, this is all with well number five being down for service. So um, moving on to the sewer fund, the year-to-date revenues in the sewer fund are $3.3 million. This is an increase of about 209000 over the previous year. The utility has spent about 70% of its budget year to date and is standing as of the end of November with a $995,000 surplus. Cash and investments uh, reserves in the sewer fund as of the end of the month were $3.9 million. The stormwater fund year to date revenues are $507,000. This is an increase of about $23,000 over the previous year. The utility has spent about 90% of its budget, so that's right on track with where it should be at, at uh, this point in the year. And it has uh, broken about even. We have a very, very, very slight surplus as of the end of November, but we're holding our own. Cash and investments total $407,000 in this fund. Uh, before we move on to the dashboards, is there any questions? I I maybe should have asked this earlier, but I think you're the right person to ask. Um, if we were to A, B, compare uh, a kilowatt hour as produced by the dam and then sold versus a kilowatt hour purchased and then sold, um, that could be figured out from this information. I mean, I'm trying to look at distribution and factor it all in, and I, got, I have to be honest, I'm just not certain I've got it. So I'd like to ask you, <laughs> um, okay. could that comparison be made? Sure. Accurately? Yes. In fact, well, it is made up. Uh, are you talking about the revenues from each or the amount of kilowatt hours that have been purchased versus generated? What I'd like is, is for it to be simplified as thoroughly as possible to, I mean, if you want to make it 100 kilowatt hours, that's fine. Um, but the generation uh, cost to generate or, or purchase mm -hmm. versus sold and, the, and then the difference between those two. You mean, is, is that, the profit margin the same? That's essentially what I'm asking. I mean, we, we've called it free power. Well, that's true if it, to an extent. We, we have expenses for the hydro Absolutely. as well. Yeah. So, and I, I'm just looking for the, the apples to oranges on that I'm one. not sure that I have a question or an answer for that question at this, that, this particular sure. time. And that's fine. We can, we can get one for you. We, okay. We, um, do, we, we, do, we have figured that and calculated that we do have it. Yes. So we'll get that. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you. Is I'm that sorry, difference? I don't have that information right yeah. now. But right, it's not free power. There's a cost to it. We know what those costs are. Right, but it's less than the wholesale power cost. Right, and, that and I assumed that, yes. but I wanted the comparison. Yep. Yeah. So we have that. thank you. Okay. The dashboards. I think I'm just going to place them up here so that they can be seen on the screen. I haven't done that in the past, but I think it's okay. Camera. Okay. Okay, there we go. Um, very simply, the electric dashboards, um, our sales are up slightly from the year before, about 208,000 kilowatt hours. So about 10.17, 10, 10,170,000 kilowatt hours have been sold this year. Um, our sales, Year to date, in each category, 
here are larger than uh, they have been in the year before. So whether it's residential, CNI, public authorities, or so forth, each one has, has realized an increase in sales over the last year. Uh, the kilowatt hours purchased uh, versus sales, we can see that, you know, that follows very closely. The bars are sales. The green bar is 2016, and the purple bar is 2017. So we're comparing the year over year on a monthly basis. And then the lines, the red line is 2016, the blue line is 2017 kilowatt hours purchased. So we can see that uh, the total sales um, were purchasing just about all of the energy. We are producing some through the, uh, the uh, hydro dams, but we're, we're, cons we're purchasing a considerable amount, amount, a considerable amount of the energy that we're selling to the public. I was just going to say, too, that question was brought up a few months ago. Why aren't those exactly lined up? Yeah. Some of it has to do with the billing date from WPPI Correct. and our billing date don't exactly line up, so that's part of the reason. So the bill, right. if the billing date's lined up to the exact date and hour, it would be overlap exactly, but it's a little off because of the billing dates. Right, right. Exactly. So it's a timing issue. I want to concentrate on the lower graph, the electrical, electric revenues versus purchase power. And the green line is purchase power. The bars are the tariff revenue and the PCAC revenue. Um, and we can see that the purchase power um, is tracking pretty regularly with the tariff revenue. The purchase power jumps up in the summer as we would expect it to. Um, we're seeing higher energy costs in this time so that the cost that we're paying for energy at this time is actually more than we're receiving in revenue, but that is made up in the lower months or the, the lower sales months. And I want to say too, so that was a new rate that our wholesale power provider put in this year. 2017 was the first year for that, where they were passing along uh, costs of power as they happened. In the past, WPPI had a flatter cost projection. They smoothed that out over the whole year. This was the first year where they were charging for power, the actual cost of power. That's why you'll see higher costs in the summer months. And what that, that is supposed to be a price signal to us and to our customers that you want to conserve in the summer when the power is more expensive. So that's why prices are higher in the summer, lower in the shoulder months, and definitely way lower in the winter. And you can see how that plays out. The, on the left side of that graph, there wasn't much PCAC, and then it went up in the summer when power costs went up. Correct. So they're going to they're do that again next year as well. The water dashboards, not too much different. Um, the big difference, I guess, is that our water sales are act, er, water gallons are actually down in 2017 from 2018 or 2016. However, our sales are up, and that was the result of our our uh, rate adjustment. So, and again, in each category of property the amount of revenue has increased over the year. I just wanted to note that we look at the number of customers that we serve. Um, that number is small, a small increase of 10 customers from October to November. So we are growing. Um, the water supplied versus wastewater treated, um, I think, is indicated the lines are influ influent and the bars are water pumped. So you can see that other than in the summer months, are, we're seeing more influent than we're pumping water. And that's an indication of inflow and infiltration in the system. We talked about that during, in prior yeah, meetings. During the wet months. Right. I'll show this, I'm not, I don't have a great deal of explanation to it. Uh, influent versus ex, eh, effluent. Um, and 
I think if we focus on this graph, uh, we're seeing the amount of water flowing in, or solids flowing into, in pounds, into, the cyst into our treatment facility, and then the, wa the amount that's being emptied out of the wastewater facility. So we're removing a, a large number, significant number of the solids in those waters uh, before it is released from the plant. And that's the water that goes back into the river, and then the solids go to Ellsworth truck. And Kevin, maybe you can explain this one to me. I'm not, um, we have the blue bar is influent flow, the red bar is effluent flow. And I'm not an expert in this. I, uh, I would expect that th these two would be reversed. Again, I think that has to do with taking in more water through, okay. through the system. And then it, so we're actually uh, have more effluent than influent because of rainwater and stuff coming into the, into the system. Some of it's still exposed to the outside. Some of our oxidation ditches are still on the exterior. Mm -hmm. So some of we're getting some of that uh, exterior moisture in there. Fair enough. We, did, we do have half of our system indoors now, which is helping quite a bit, but we still have some exterior oxidation. Next, we'll move on to the Powerful Choices dashboards. Um, focus on energy for November. Um, Customer incentives provided about $16,000. Customer incentives collections, $4,000. So we're returning four to one on, uh, on the incentives. Um, same thing on the next graph. This is the, just the year to date. This is just, this first graph is only for November. <laughs> This graph is year to date. So I want to I want to highlight that because that's a big darn deal, and I've shared that with council as yeah. well. So, we we've collected so far this year forty eight thousand four hundred dollars for, for focused energy money on people's utility bill that's required by the PSC. We have some very talented people that work at our utility that go out and solicit programs to help our customers, both residential, small commercial, large commercial. And they have brought $128,860 back into the community. So we've invested $48,000, and we brought $128,000 back. And there's a little known caveat. We've also did a fairly big project with UWRF. We're going to get an additional, I think, $65,000 that has not been accounted for here yet. So this year is going to be an outstanding year where we're going to have invested about fifty to $55,000, and we're going to have gotten over $200,000 back. Now, I can say it here in this group, I don't know how many people are going to watch the tape of this, but that's something we try not to brag about too much at a lot of meetings because people are going to start asking what we're doing here. We're, getting, we're very good at it. Um, Mike Noreen and Wes Arndt are very good at that. They know the system. They, know they, can, they have good connection with our customers. And we're able to bring a real nice chunk of money back into the community, and I would call that a good investment. Invest 50 and get back 200. <laughs> not bad. Finally... Um, I just wanted to show where we are in the process of renewal energy blocks. Um, our goal is 635. We're sitting at 630. The graph looks a little skewed because yeah, it's, yeah, it's skewed. Looks to it's, the so uh, at one. And I'll, <laughs> at one. Can I emphasize but, something there too? So we're five away. So we're five away. We're at 92 or 9.92%, which is, you know. That's a magic number. So five more. So maybe we can get five more tonight. But if we get five more people, 10%. five more people who will voluntarily contribute $3 a month to the green energy block, we will be at 10% of our customers. So we're five away from being at 10%. I have a few people laying in the weeds. They want to be that last one, so. <laughs> <laughs> Put us over the Put top. Put us over the top. Yeah. But that's, a, that's remarkable. So this is different than the focus on energy money that I was just referring to. That focus on energy money is required for us to collect that the PSC requires us. This program here, we have, we'll have, we have 630 customers right now who are voluntarily contributing $3 a month. That's amazing. What a commitment by this community. With that, that ends the dashboard segment, and any questions that you have of those, I will entertain. 
All right. Well, thank you very much. Thanks, and Al. I hope you have a very nice holidays. You too. Thank you. Thank you very Thanks, much. Thanks, Al. Does anybody have any questions on the letter info? We move on to announcements. Um, I, one maybe side announcement. So Dwayne is term expires uh, early next year, and I think this might be Dwayne's last meeting as he's going to be flying south, snowbird. <laughs> and uh, I think your last meeting is scheduled for May. So maybe we can get you back in May. Sure. It's for your last meeting and uh, say goodbye then. Until then, just enjoy the heck out of the warm weather down south. I will. How far south do you go, Dwayne? Sarasota, Florida. Sarasota, very nice. So we're all jealous. And uh, so yeah, we'll get we'll see you back here hopefully in May then, and then to say goodbye and say thank you. But uh, sounds good. Enjoy your winter. Great job to your crew, Kevin, on the lights downstairs or downtown. Thanks, thanks. Look great. Yeah, yeah. And I have to say, so uh, I kind of turned. So I've really tried to give that turn that over to our line crews and have them have ownership in that. And Logan Schneider, one of our apprentices, had the idea of the red and white lights on the trunks. And they came up with the idea, and I just said, hey, it's your baby. You guys do what you think, and if it doesn't look good, we won't do it again. But uh, so they put them up, and uh, boy, that, I think they look pretty neat, too. Yep. So thanks for Great noticing. Job. Perfect. All right. Well, thank Logan Schneider, the apprentice. All right. Anybody else? All right. We're adjourned. Here we go.